Welcome back to another episode of the House Husband Diaries. As always, I am your host, Carter C. And today, all of you political fans, I am going to take a little bit of a detour. It's, uh, it's not really a full detour. I mean, we're going to the same place. But really what I wanted to, to talk about and kind of start a series is, is more to get away from the, the candidates, at least for a little while. So there will be plenty of stuff to discuss, plenty of missteps, I'm sure, plenty of, uh, can, uh, of candidate you know, quotes and debates and Super Tuesdays coming up and all kinds of things to, to look at over the, the month of March, April, and, and into November as we get to the election. But what I thought I would do is kind of take a step back from the candidates and, and look at some of the economic factors. Because to me, that's what's most important. Uh, and that's how I've said, you know, in my How I Vote video, I mean, that's what I look at. That's how I decide to vote for the 2016 election. I felt like Donald Trump, for all his warts, for all of his problems, would be better at running uh, the economy and trade deals. Yes, I know those of you who disagree with me, um, who voted for Hillary, you know, yes, Donald Trump went bankrupt a number of filed for bankruptcy a number of times. I, I get it. Like he's not perfect. I, there is no, there's no reason why you should you should correlate me saying that I voted for Trump uh, based off of him being able to run the economy better than Hillary Clinton as a vote that Donald Trump is the best person in the United States to run the United States uh, from the president position. Uh, you know, to run the United States economy. That's just illogical and, and a huge leap. I have, I have two choices, two real choices, Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump. And Hillary Clinton's never run anything in her life legally. So there was no choice. She wrote in on the coattails of Bill Clinton. And for those of you who think, and who have said this to me privately or, or publicly, this is fine, I'll go ahead and get this out there because it's silly. And then we'll move on to, to economics. Is, is, oh, are you afraid of, of, of a strong woman? Uh, have you seen the name of my channel? It's called The House Husband Diaries. You know why I'm a house husband? Because my wife has a much greater earnings uh, power and potential than I do, and I have a master's degree. So uh, I'm pretty sure I'm not scared of a, of a, of a highly intelligent, uh, strong personality, powerful woman. Pretty sure I'm not. Just getting that out of the way there. So like that's the whole that's the whole joke of the house husband diaries, right? Is that I lean more conservatively in my political and fiscal mindset. Yet uh, one of the big takes that uh, big swipes that the left likes to take at, at white men is that oh we must not you must be afraid of strong, intelligent, powerful women. <laughs> yeah. Keep telling yourself that. So Anywho, that had nothing to do with, with this, but I want to go to, to the economic side of things and to talk through it because I think a lot of people have differing ideas, differing opinions, so I'm going to put mine out there, try to back them up as best I can, and then I'm sure I'll get tons of comments and it'll be fun to, to discuss. I'm sure we'll get into a ton uh, of rabbit holes, but where I thought I would, where I thought I would go with, with that in this series to start with is my own personal financial uh, experience, right? So the reason why I'm moving to this topic is that whoever wins the president, uh, you know, the, the presidential election in 2020, later this year, in 2024, in 2028, in 2032, I mean, we're talking for the next, you know, however long, but especially now, that president will have to deal with at some point, we'll have to face the financial music that America has been playing the last three presidencies. And one of the last things that I put, but I will go ahead and, and, and mention it now early in the video, is, is um, I guess I, I put it on my, my research for the next video, but, but I'll go ahead and say it in this video, is that the last three presidents, including Donald Trump, so W, George W. Bush, Barack Obama, and, and Donald Trump, all three have increased our national debt exponentially. All three, Republican and Democrat. 
the last person to decrease the debt was Bill Clinton. So those of you who are Democrats and say that, you know, I'm a homer or whatever, I'm, I'm, giving, I'm, I'm giving support there, right? So you can't say I'm, I'm just some biased hack, right? Now, how he did it, I, I disagree with, but he did, okay? All right, so I think there's a better way to get to the same end goal that Bill Clinton did. He just slashed defense spending, but... That, that's for another video on down the road. So really what I thought would be a good, a good experiment would be to share my personal experience with money, with debt, and, and that way to kind of go through, because, because it's, easier, it's easier to discuss tens of thousands of dollars than it is tens of trillions of dollars. Because once we get into the billions and trillions, it's, it's zeros that most, most of us don't really understand. And, and, and all of us really have a hard time conceptualizing, right? I mean, you say, oh my God, that guy's a billionaire. Or, oh my gosh, that woman, Oprah, is a billionaire. You go, okay, how many zeros is that? Right? There's nine zeros. One, comma, Zero 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 comma zero 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 comma zero zero zero. Right. So it's it's ten hundred million dollars. You have a hundred million times ten is a billion dollars. So if you're talking a billion dollars, I can give nine hundred million dollars away and still have a hundred million dollars. That's just really hard to fathom because people go, oh my gosh, you know, if you, if you had a billion dollars and you gave $900 million away, you'd still be sitting on $100 million. And I've told my close friends and we talk about all kinds of stuff, you know, and I'm like, I, I don't, if I won the lottery and I won like $150 million after taxes or whatever, like I don't, I do not know that I could spend $150 million. I, I just, like that does not compute to me. I don't need a house with 42 bathrooms. I don't even want a house with 42 bathrooms. I might rent one for like a weekend or a week or something just to get me some Instagram pictures or something, but I'm not going to buy that. That just doesn't, it, it's just silly. So when I look at, when I look at these numbers, I think the way politicians look at these numbers is that they just assume those of us in in the rest of, of the populace are just so dumb about numbers that they're just it, the numbers don't compute so they'll just say whatever they want to say because we can't do the math on our own behind the scenes and, and then call them out on it so they'll just continue on doing what they're doing and I think it's important to just kind of look at at the numbers and go hey you know this is possible Let's find a common sense approach and, and, and see, see what we come up with. So before we do that, let's start with, with personal situations because ultimately, if someone's not good with their personal finances, if someone cannot balance their own checkbook, they, they really shouldn't be in charge of, of the government's checkbook, really. So what I'll say is uh, I started off with with no debt from a from from college, so my parents were were nice enough, and I you don't need to say oh well you know whatever whatever you think about that you just keep to yourself okay that's where I started out I didn't ask for that that was not that was just part of the deal of where I was born and how that works so I got a college degree for free on my parents they were nice enough to do that for me. And then they said, okay, the rest is on your own. So I started in, from that standpoint. I did have to pay for my master's degree, so it's not like I got everything for free. So uh, we'll just, we'll just, we'll get to that later. So basically, I was very fiscally conservative in my 20s, uh, the beginning part of my 20s. I saved money. I had money. I didn't do anything on credit. If I didn't have money, then I wouldn't, I wouldn't spend money. And a roommate of mine at the time, and I decided we would start investing. And one of the things that we thought we would do is we would buy a house, and then we would live in it, and then we, when we decided to move, we would keep the house, and we would rent it out. And then at some point, 
we would sell it for a big gain. Well, neither one of us had any credit debt because we didn't have credit cards. We just, we, we, we had everything in cash. We had money in the bank. And so we went to our own individual banks and tried to get a line of credit. And they said, we cannot give you the bank. This is like 2003, 2004. And they said, we, we can't give you a line of credit because you have no credit. You have, you have a zero credit score. Like you don't, you just don't even have a credit score. And I said, I don't understand. I've got money in my bank. You can see that I have cash in my bank account. And they said, yeah, we see that, but we can't lend you money based off of the cash you have in your bank account because you don't have a credit score. What? I mean, this is pre YouTube. This is pre, you know, the internet boom at all it's like where you, you, this this information is you you can just you know search it in google or youtube and you can get a video about personal credit scores and, and how that works that information just wasn't as readily available back in the 2002 to 2004 uh, time frame and so that was a complete shock and then my buddy goes to his bank and basically they said the same thing so we, we come back from our from our jobs, we come back to the house and, and we're like, hey, how was your experience, you know, with the bank and how whatever. And we, we compare notes and they're like, oh my gosh, neither one of us can get a line of credit or you know a, a home mortgage because um, we don't have any we don't have a credit score. And we're like, how crazy is that? We have thousands and thousands of dollars in cash and we want to get a loan based off of this asset that we have. And the banks are refusing to give us a loan off of currency, off of, uh, off of an asset, because there's no credit score, random credit score. So then they're like, well, here's how you build your credit. You have to get a credit card, and then you know you need multiple lines, whatever, they, the whole thing with, with how you build credit. And so we're like, well, how long does that take? And they were like, well, it's gonna, you know, it'll take a year at least, and then you know, more than that. And, and it was fascinating to me because never in my life, in all the history, so I mean, I was, I, I went through school all the way, right, through college and everything, and, and you never hear about people that show up with cash or with gold or with whatever is the currency of the day and show up somewhere and say, I'd like to buy something. Here's an asset. Here's my money. And people go, we're, we're not going to take your money. We couldn't possibly take your money because you don't have a credit score. You don't have this made up thing that uh, we now use instead of assets. I mean, fast forward 10, 12 years, right? And then I get a master's degree in accounting. And that still blows my mind even more. It's just the craziest thing in the world that we have moved away from you actually have money to, well, we need to know that you have a good credit score. Well, if you have money in the bank, you probably have a good credit score because you have money in the bank, right? Nope, not how that works. Not how that works. A good credit score, you can have zero money in the bank and you can just be cash flow and everything and you have a great credit and the bank will give you a loan, which if you go upside down on because you're so mm, leveraged, to the point that if your cash flow changes at any point, with your, if, your, if your income changes at any point, then you just, all of your debts go, go away. I mean, it's insane. Just the whole, the whole idea is it, it, that our economy has been building and growing off of all this credit where we extend ourselves and over leverage ourselves and we just continue and can continue and continue. It's silly. So I got my first credit card. I started building my credit. And then at the time, things changed. We didn't go in. Uh, we didn't buy anything. And uh, basically, I quit my job and I started a, well, I, I did another job. And then I started a nonprofit. And I talked about that a long time ago, way back uh, months and months ago, one of my first videos. So I started this nonprofit. And basically, the idea of the nonprofit was to create a, an international nonprofit database, searchable database, that if you wanted to volunteer anywhere in the world, 
that we would, uh, you could go search it. And you'd have an interactive map and you could watch videos of, of what the, the work that those nonprofits are doing, yada, yada, yada. Uh, I put this out here in 2020, the, this, this idea I had in 2007 and, um, or eight, nine, I don't know, a long time ago, over a decade ago, I tried it and maybe I was too soon for the technology or whatnot, but you're more than welcome to try it. It was, a, it was cool. Uh, I'm not going to go back and do it because I don't really have the freedom to go travel the world and shoot videos and upload them and do the website anymore. Uh, it would be fun to, to be a part of it. But anyway, it was a really cool idea. And uh, I've sh shared videos of India. I'll share more of my travels uh, around the world because I, I was doing it for a while. But I was trying to I was trying to, to raise money for this nonprofit and I was trying to, to write grants and uh, talk to donors and, and try to, to really build this nonprofit from the ground up. And basically that was my job. But I started it right after the, the financial crisis and, and the stock market dropped. And people just, it was a really tough time to start a nonprofit. It was really uh, a really large goal that at the time was hard for people to get their minds around. Because most of the people with money at that time were old school and they weren't used to using the internet and the idea of videos on the internet were still very new and um, interactive databases and stuff but it just anyway uh, it was a very it was a very interesting time and so I had a number of offers to come and work for specific organizations and do their multimedia and that just wasn't really the point of what I wanted to do I didn't really care what um, you know, denomination you were or what your beliefs were and all that kind of stuff. It's like, if you were doing good around the world, I wanted to highlight you and I wanted to highlight your work and I wanted to share that with the, the wider community of the world. Well, that didn't really resonate with a lot of people who were very much, um, very supportive of their own beliefs and, and not supportive of, of any other people's beliefs. And so that was a really interesting and trying time for me because I wanted to do good for the world and for, for people that were trying to do good and try to help them market what they were doing. And, uh, and so really I had a hard time. Well, I believed in this vision. I believed in this goal. I believed in the, the purpose of what I was doing, but I wasn't really making any money. In fact, I was losing money every year. So all of the money that I saved up over the years from working, I spent. And then I had credit cards, and then I started going through the credit cards. And what was really fascinating about that time in my life is that as I would near a credit limit, I would get a, a letter in the mail from the credit card companies or the banks that I had credit cards with, and they would, they would say, well, you're, you're such a great customer that we're going to extend you more credit. So if your credit limit's 5000 now your credit is going to be 7000 or 8000 or 8000 to 10000 or 10000 to 12000 12000 to 15000 and finally they would say uh, you know it got to the point where i had 20 some thousand dollars and it ended up being like maybe 25000 i don't remember exactly what it was it was a, a number of years ago um, they kind of they said okay we can't extend you any more credit uh, you need to start paying these these credit cards down but I still didn't have any money, and I just assumed that they, these banks, I mean, we've been doing this for years, that they were just going to keep keep extending me credit, and I was going to keep paying minimums and keep living on, on these credit cards. I mean, that's a very short uh, synopsis of, of four years or so uh, of time. But basically, over, over that time frame, it was really hard to get the nonprofit off the ground and, and, uh, and so I basically just lived off of these credit cards. Well, time came up where I didn't have the money and I needed to get jobs and I was still, I still believed in the nonprofit, but it wasn't working. And so I basically uh, defaulted on the credit and someone bought the credit, right? Uh, lawyers or whoever, they'll just buy credit, uh, people's credit debt, and then they'll, uh, put lawsuits against them and, and say, okay, you owe us all this money. And at the time I didn't really know you could settle. I, I guess I kind of heard you could like settle out of, um, uh, I don't know, you could settle your debt. Like they buy your debt for pennies on the dollar and you can settle for pennies on the dollar and all that 
stuff. But I felt like, you know, I had, I had lived for a number of years on these credit cards and I, I had spent that money. So I, I should pay it back. Like I just felt, I felt like basically the idea of me settling my debt for pennies on the dollars didn't, that was a band aid. It would get me out of debt. It would stop all of that other stuff. But really what I needed was I needed to work hard. I needed to get a job. I ended up getting two jobs and I worked tons of hours round the clock. Basically I worked night shift and day and I just took naps in between jobs for a long time. And I just started paying off what I had. I really watched what, uh, I really watched what I was, what I was consuming as far as food goes. I really, you know, I didn't go out a whole lot. I didn't go out hardly any. I didn't, I didn't really do, do much of anything. Um, I, I just ran and biked and, and ate, you know, pasta and frozen veggies and drank water and, and everything I made basically went to pay off debt as quickly as possible. And this is before I found, you know, listen to Dave Ramsey any, and I've never bought any of his stuff or whatever, but I listened to it on the radio and, and actually came to some of a lot of the same conclusions that he came to um, and that he espouses. And I think, I think a lot of his stuff's really good. And I, I think some of it's not so good, but, uh, so, but basically it was, that I needed to change the way I looked at money um, because I looked at it very healthy in a very healthy way in my early twenties. And then when this whole like, Oh, you need to build a credit score came out. It was like, it's like free money and it's not free money. And with the banks and every and financial institutions that continue to just, just, you know, basically write blank checks and just say, okay, we're going to increase your debt or uh, limit, you know, your credit card limit, then you can just keep on spending and keep on spending. And so really the root of the problem was how I looked at money and how, how I was spending money. And so I needed for me not to, not to settle my debt and get out with 5,000 paying $5,000 instead of 25,000. I needed to say, okay, like I'm going to live a life where I can, I can earn money at hourly wage jobs. This is before I got a master's degree. I worked two hourly wage jobs, one at night, overnight shift, and one during the day. And I need to pay back twenty five thousand, even though I know I can get out of, of of debt for for maybe less than that. But what I need to do is I need to say, hey, I own this. I I spent that money, and I'm going to pay it back. And that's just my decision. I'm not I'm not downing anybody that files for bankruptcy and and gets out of their debt. I don't think that's right. I don't, but it's legal because somebody's stuck with that. Somebody's stuck with that debt. Now we get that, that opens a whole can of worms in terms of, uh, in terms of, um, uh, the, the credit card interest rates and all that kind of stuff. And you start nearing 20% and all that. I mean, that's, that's really, I don't believe in that either, but all of this is to say, what America is going through is an increase in, and we've, we've gone through several of these cycles with the dot-com bubble and now, and then in the financial crisis of what, seven and eight, and, and we're moving back to housing bubble stuff and we're moving back into it. And so the president of the United States over the next few terms is, is, is going to have to deal with a lot of these financial issues. And, and the deal is not to be able to, to just stick the debt with somebody else. The deal is really, it's a much bigger situation than how we as a country are responsible for, or do we even view a responsibility, ourselves as responsible for, for the money that we're spending and, and for the promises that we're making, not only to, to each other, to the American people, but to other countries. And so I think that's really kind of what I want to, uh, to get across here is, is that at some point, as a country, we have to dial it back and we have to look at each other in the eye and we have to say, hey, we're fiscally responsible. And right now, our government hasn't been for the last three presidents and before, but um, we're basically at the same point. Uh, I'll make this point later in another video, but we're basically nearing the same point of 
of debt to GDP ratio that we were in World War II, but we're not in World War. So we've got this growing debt crisis, national debt, which we, you and I own most of the national debt. And so our politicians are just basically spending all this money and promises to us so that they get reelected and then they're saddling us with the bill. They're just made, well, they'll just pay for it later on. And so it's up to, to my generation to, to right the wrongs of the baby boomer generation, of all the, pol the politicians that are, that are in power now. And it's all of these people that are 70s into their 80s. I don't know why they're in, in still in power in the 80s, but you know, these 60s and 70 year olds that, that have just been spending money for the last however many decades and put us in a very precarious situation. Now, I'll take a look at the rest of the world, um, the top 10 economies in the world, and how all of that debt, who owns what part of the debt, and, and I'll get into some details in, in later videos. And the next video uh, for in, the, in the political realm is just going to be more about our national debt. But I just this, this video is just kind of to share my personal experience. I guess the other thing I'll say, too, is that after I got out of debt, I, mean, I paid it all off, and I was super pumped. I immediately went back into debt to go get a master's degree. And that was super disheartening because you spend all of this time, years paying off debt and then to go back into to debt to pay uh, for student loans. But that's considered good debt, which is a whole nother story about what's good and what's, what's not good. Um, and then my car died um, and I needed, to, I needed to get a new car. And so then I bought a car. And basically what I'll say about that, just to wrap that up really quickly and wrap this video up, is that, is that um, I, my car had a higher interest rate than my student loans. And the car loan was, actually, was also smaller than my combined student loans. And so I paid off everything. Once I got out of my student loans, I didn't have to pay off till like six months after I got out of, I graduated from, from school. And so once I got a job, uh, I just I just started paying off the car as quickly as possible. I mean, I've been paying monthly, uh, all the monthly minimums and everything. But then, but then I just said, okay, I got I got to pay off the car, and that's where I say kind of that Dave Ramsey. I think they call it the um, the debt snowball or something. And I just said that you know uh, the car is the highest one. It's, it wasn't the smallest individual uh, debt that I had, but I just knew that it would be it would be the best to when you looked at the two car and student loans as two loans, the car was smaller, but the student loans were made up of individual loans, but you don't even know. So I just told it, told that to you for no reason. But basically, you, just, you know, then it was just, okay, now I'm making more money. I, was, I have a master's degree of making more money. So now I'm just going to, I'm going to go back and I'm going to attack it. It still took a couple of years, but the, the spending habits were instilled in me. And, and I think the years of having to to, to tighten up the belt and to say, okay, like I'm not going to spend money because I really need to get out of debt first was a really good learning experience. And, and I think at some point our politicians are going to need to make that same, that same sacrifice. And, and in that same vein, we as voters are going to have to make that sacrifice before the politicians do, because we're, we have to lead, we have to lead by example, by voting in, not only a president, but a, a, a Senate and a, a Congress that has the same values that will uh, enact legislation to, to limit our government spending and, um, and, and begin balancing the, the, the budget and then, and then pay off our national debt just so we can be fiscally sound moving well into the 21st century. Not, not because we can't continue on the way we're going for some time. We can, it's just gonna hurt worse later on. So anyway, that's my personal experience with debt, with getting out of debt. So I just wanted to share that with you guys um, as we move into more economics um, in, the, in the political realm. And uh, yeah, as always, like, subscribe, comment. Let me know what your thoughts are. You can email me. If you don't wanna do a public comment, you can email me privately, carter at Diaries. Dot com. I'd love to hear from, from all of you. I enjoy any, anything that you have to say. Um, you know, if you have similar experiences, if you, if you don't, you share. 
Um, it's just really about building a community of people that are, are um, willing to listen and willing to share uh, life. So thanks so much for watching again this episode of the House Husband Diaries. Until tomorrow morning, hope you have a great day.